What I'm going to do now is introduce our two moderators, and they will in turn introduce uh, this very esteemed panel. So um, the topic, as you know, is 20-something. And uh, how many people here are 20-something? Got a good audience here. Good. OK, great. To my left here is Robin Morantz Hennig. She's a freelance science writer and a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine. Her articles have also appeared in Scientific American, Seed, Discover, and many women's magazines. In addition, she writes book reviews and occasional essays for the Washington Post, as well as articles for the New York Times Science Section, Op-Ed Page, and Book Review. Robin wrote the 2010 New York Times Magazine cover story, What Is It About 20-somethings? that went viral and sparked this terrific new book on the culture and science of being young, which she wrote with her daughter, Samantha Hennig, who is over there at the end. And I'll tell you a little bit about Samantha. Samantha Hennig is the online editor at the New York Times Magazine and the co-author of 20-something. She previously, previously worked at The New Yorker as the digital news editor and at Newsweek, both in print and online, and she helped launch Double X, a women's web magazine that was part of the Slate group. While at Slate, she recorded and produced podcasts of the Explainer column and wrote and starred in a series of videos. Um, one more hand. Uh, the, um, the wonderful book that sparked all this is called 20-something, Why Do Young Adults Ste Seem Stuck? And if you'd like to purchase it, we have it right over there in the corner on your way out. You can take a look at it. And uh, Robin and Samantha will be happy to sign it. In the meantime, please give a hearty welcome to Robin and Samantha Hennig. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, we're really delighted to be here and to have our wonderful panel of experts who are going to talk about um, what it's like to be 20-something, who we'll introduce in a moment. Um, I just wanted to give you a little background. Um, I did write that article in the New York Times Magazine in 2010 called what is it about 20-somethings? I think it went viral partly because 20-somethings were really p pissed off at the title, at the, um, the illustrations, at the idea that the New York Times was telling them that there was something wrong with them. That's not what I wrote, actually, and it's not what I meant. But it did get some publishers interested in having me write a book about it. And I basically said, OK, I'll write a book about it, but only if I can do it with my daughter. Actually, I said only if I could do it with my two daughters, but one of them who's here said, no, I'm not crazy enough to write a book with my mother. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't wise enough to uh, have that response initially. <laughs> um, so anyway, so we wrote this book, and Sam's going to tell you a little bit about what it was like and why we thought that this kind of panel would be um, a good outgrowth of the, our experience writing the book. Uh, yeah, so I did agree to um, be the expert 20-something um, in this book project, and I knew going into it that that meant that I had to sort of uh, do some amount of speaking for 20-somethings, you know, because the, I am the 20-something voice in this book, and that made me a little uncomfortable um, because I think of myself more as a journalist. I'm more comfortable interviewing people and quoting other people. I, I'm not as fond of, you know, speaking as myself. Um, and so I was really excited about the idea of, of having this panel because now we can get other people to speak as themselves and it takes some of the pressure off of me to be the only 20-something um, voice in the book. Uh, we, we actually only have one 20-something voice on stage with us, that's Brian. Um, but we are going to make everyone just Once like... 20-something, always a 20-something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> everyone on stage has once been a 20-something. Um, and so I'm excited for all of us to sort of share the burden of remembering what that is like. Right. Uh, so let me let you know who the uh, panelists are, and we're going to talk amongst ourselves in front of you for um, about 40 or 45 minutes, and then we're going to open it up for questions from the audience, because that might be quite interesting. And uh, we decided that we're, we're going to say the ages of everyone that we introduce, but when we open things up for questions, we want you to say your ages too, just to be fair. <laughs> Um, do you want you start with Brian over here? Okay. I thought you were doing Brian. Well, um, oh right, I was doing Brian. Yeah. I'm first. <laughs> Brian Stelter is the 
co-star of the documentary Page One, which is about the New York Times. I don't know how many of you have seen that. Um, he's the media reporter at the New York Times and writes the Media Decoder blog. He's also working on a book about morning news shows called Top of the Morning, and he's only 27. <laughs> Feel older. <laughs> Emily Gould is 31, um, one of the early bloggers. Um, she had her own blog and then was a gawker blogger for a while, and now she runs Emily Books, which is an online bookstore where you can get a book every month. Um, and she also wrote a New York Times Magazine cover story um, that was also very buzzed about, which was sort of a, a memoir-ish um, piece about being in your, her 20s. Um, so she's already put it all out there, so this is nothing new for her to do it here tonight. <laughs> Anna Holmes is 39, Jack Benny's age. For those of you who are my age, you might know <laughs> what I mean by that. Um, Anna is the founder of the website Jezebel, um, which she left a couple of years ago um, to go off and keep doing its own thing. And since then, she's been writing for places like the Washington Post, the New Yorker, and the New York Times. And she's also been editing the giant Book of Jezebel, which is coming out next year. And Mike Weinrip is a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter for the New York Times who has written about education, mental health, parenting, and he's now running the blog about boomers on the Times. And he's also the father of four children, three of whom are in their 20s. You all and didn't... I'm 60. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, and he's yeah, You all didn't say your name. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm 28. <laughs> and I'm 59. <laughs> <laughs> that really makes me very unhappy, but... <laughs> um, now everyone in the audience has to go around and say their age. <laughs> Just when it'll, you it'll dare to ask a, a question. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when we were talking really? earlier backstage um, and going through our ages, um, Anna and Emily said that they were very happy not to be in their 20s anymore. So can we start by sort of talking about why that is? I don't want to bring astrology into this. <laughs> <laughs> so early on. <laughs> Thought we'd get around to that later after another drink. But um, there's this idea, whether, regardless of whether you believe that the stars control our destinies, there is this idea that um, in your late 20s, you're in a period called um, your Saturn returns. It's where Saturn is in the position in, it, in your natal chart that it was when you were born. And during those three years, you either become an adult or you don't. And it's like Saturn, who is the father figure um, planet, so, so who sort of brings like bad stuff that you need to get through in order to become a grown up, throws everything at you that you possibly could have to deal with. And then you have to like come through all these obstacles to become the person who you are meant to be. And oh my God, it's real. It's totally <laughs> real, you guys. I don't know if, if anyone has like experienced this and can back me up on this, but the time between when you are like late 26 to maybe 30-ish, 31, is rough. You have to become a grown-up. And um, even if you think you already are when you're 26, that is tested in every conceivable way. It's interesting that you said it ends at 31, your oh. age. I mean, so do you think that that's when you became a grown-up two months ago? Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I mean... Not to get super specific about my own natal chart, but Saturn just left Libra um, last month. So things are going to turn a corner for me. I'm, I, wait, I'm, I, I have faith. I think I, I, I'm a I science journalist. Gonna... I feel a little uncomfortable having the first thing we talk about be astrology. So maybe... <laughs> you know, it, Although it does explain so much for me already. Like, yeah. Regardless of... I mean, astrology is obviously bullshit, but... I think there are a lot of obvious reasons why your late 20s are, it can be some of the hardest years in your life. If you had a lot of success early on, you have to change your identity in order to continue to succeed, really. Um, people are living longer, and for most people, that's probably going to be the time in their lives when they're, they're experiencing the deaths of people who they care a lot about for the first time. Um, that's a real thing that makes you into an adult. Um, I don't know. I mean, life is hard at every stage, but I feel that this is a particularly hard life stage. Do you think that it's um, uh, 
at all gender specific? Do you think it's harder for, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's this cliche that women get very upset about growing older, you know, oh my God, 30 is a big deal and 40 is horrible and, you know, not to mention 50. And I didn't feel that way. I, most of, when I was in my 20s, I didn't like my 20s, but I looked forward to getting older because the women that I admired the most in terms of their self-possession and confidence and, and achievements, but, but mostly like how they felt about themselves um, and the ways that they moved in the world were all in their 30s and above. None of them were in their 20s. I didn't really admire any, any 20-somethings. <laughs> but what was it about uh, your 20s that you say you didn't like? I mean, was it well, just confusing or? I, I, think, I, think it was, I think it was, I don't like to use the word spiritual, but probably was spiritual. I mean, emotional, financial, I mean, I, I, I lived paycheck to paycheck. Um, I mean, some people live paycheck to paycheck their entire lives, so I can, you know, I feel lucky that I don't anymore as much. But living in New York, um, dating was horrible. It didn't get much better, I guess, in my thirties. <laughs> I think I think I think I put up with less when I got into my thirties. So I was l less likely to put myself into situations where I was yet, you know, disappointed yet again. Um, but uh, a lot of experimentation that I think was self-destructive um, in terms of, you know, I would drink too much once in a while. I, mean, I was just. I think I think when you're in your twenties, your your body and maybe your mind can handle a lot, and so you kind of try and. Um, push the limits. Uh, well, that all basically sounds like stuff that would apply to both genders. Well, what I, I, was, I was speaking specifically about, about um, you know, there are expectations on women even now, even though there are so many more women who remain single later into their lives, but there's still ex expectations that their worth is, 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 you know, revolves around their attractiveness, their fertility, whether they are partnered, whether they have children, maybe not so much in New York, but even in New York, and so I think that maybe entering your late 20s, I started thinking, am I gonna get married? Am I ever gonna find, I, I, I'm just not sure that I was, I, I'm not sure that a guy at that age was, was thinking about those things. Maybe well, we somewhere. have a guy at that age. Do you feel like there's a lot of, yeah, like- Brian, do you feel your fertility as a ticking time bomb? <laughs> just wondering. I'm trying not to answer, I'm not even picking up the microphone. Uh, uh, um, hmm. Or are you totally, not even aware of it as a... I, I, you know, I wish my girlfriend was here to answer these questions for me. Uh, I, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think I feel that pressure, if that's the right word, pressure. Um, however, I did, I did hear something interesting from, from a colleague this week, or a colleague of a colleague, who said, uh, get married, have the kids when you're young, get it over with, so that after, <laughs> but by the time they're 18, you're still young enough to enjoy it. And that got wheels turning. And I feel like a lot of what 20 something is about is having people say those sorts of nuggets and they get in your brain and they infiltrate and they get you thinking about your 30s and your 40s. And you know, so because so That's much what of 20 something, people do. So much of 20 something is about just preparing, thinking about what the next 30 years look like, even though well, you have no idea. Mike, Mike, uh, Mike, you seem to think that was a funny thing to right. say that you could get your children right. over with. And did I say out of the way? That, <laughs> that, that, I didn't, I didn't say when that, you right? have children and they're sitting in the audience and you say, get them over with, they're going to have a different feeling about that. Yeah. Um, you know, I can barely remember my 20s, I'll tell you that. Um, it's a great time. Um, you're young, you have energy, um, you know, um, you have lots of sex with different people. Um, it's great. Um, it's also very hard. I watch my own kids. I have three kids in their 20s. It's much harder today. I mean, I was able to get out of college and have a career. I started at a little paper in Rochester, New York, and I went to a bigger paper in Hazard, Kentucky, and then Louisville, Kentucky, and then Miami, and then the Times. I could work my way up. In every place, I get a better salary, um, more responsibility. Uh, today, I think it's much harder. I see people in their 20s, writers, and they're writing online, and they're not getting compensated for what they should be getting compensated. It's very exploitive, and there's, um, there doesn't seem to be a mechanism. In the newspaper business, there were unions you know, that, that helped us uh, through that. Today, everybody's uh, their own person, um, and that's wonderful in some ways, but. And not only is it hurting 20-somethings, it's hurting the established media. You know, you did, were... did you feel like um, you had to sort of know in your 20s where you were heading in a way that maybe your kids don't feel or maybe that Anna didn't feel? You know, that might be a class thing. I came from a blue-collar family, and so right away, you know, if I had the luxury, I would have liked to write novels and you know, nonfiction books from the start. 
Um, but I didn't have that luxury. I had to make money. Whereas my kids come from a professional class family. My wife and I both work for the Times. We make good salaries. So there's less pressure on them. So I think um, it's a more wealthy society now. So I think younger people do have maybe a little more freedom in that sense. Mm -hmm. I sometimes find myself hoping that the the twenty somethings that we, we when, when there's a, if there is a stereotype of twenty somethings I don't know if there is it would maybe it would be that um, they're having a harder time finding work they're having a harder time advancing they're having a harder time figuring out what that uh, first step and second step of the ladder is I found myself hoping they're going to live as long as the scientists say they will into their hundreds because because if it takes longer time to start they deserve to have the same amount of luxury later. Right. I think um, one of the big I, I'm betting on science, basically. <laughs> <laughs> one of the stereotypes, from what I understand of 20-somethings, um, is that they're sort of spoiled and entitled, at least 20-somethings today, millennials. Um, and, and that sort of goes to what you're saying about the way that your job progressed, you know, this, this idea of paying your dues and starting at a small place and working your way up. And then you've got this guy like Brian who just sort of sweeps in from the internet. Well, but he didn't. <laughs> but, but Brian did. I mean, he, worked very, he worked very hard and he got... I mean, I'm still was, paying you know, my dues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no I had to write a crappy short story today that, you know, that I didn't want to write. I, mean, I, I do... Th I mean, it, it is a... I was very lucky to leap to the times at an early age uh, after blogging all through college kind of for free, essentially, even though I was paid a little bit by Media Bistro at the time. But I do feel like people, young people at the time, still do pay their dues, just in a different way, um, with the grunt work or the short stories that, frankly, I like to do because I get a free byline out of them. I get another clip, uh, but that aren't fun to do, right? Um, and then I, I, you know, and I, and I see that in other careers as well. Young people are still having to pay their dues in some ways, right? But well, I, I don't think. I, but I think at the same time, there's a there's a sense that we are entitled and spoiled, whether we are or not, and we have to right. combat that perception, whether or not it's real. So I don't think that's true in the least. I don't think young people are spoiled, or and I don't think most people have that perception either. Um, you know, watching mine, watching twenty somethings I know, they're killing themselves. And as you say at the times, um, you know, it's a rough period, a lot of self exploitation. Well, that, that's awfully generous of you, but when people found out I was writing a book about 20-somethings, I can't tell you how many people told me, oh, the young people in my office don't want to do X, Y, and Z. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, are they still in your office? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an office, but so I, was, be, I thought maybe they were telling the truth. It, might be, it might be the, the class of, of, of the kids as opposed, to, as opposed to their age. I mean, I know that I worked at... Um, in Style Magazine many years ago, for maybe like a year and a half, and there were interns there. And most of the interns um, were the children of, I don't want to say famous people, but you know, influential people or people who had money. And a lot of them you know, would kind of roll their eyes when you asked them to, um, to do an intern thing. I don't mean getting me lunch. I mean you know, photocopying something. And mm -hmm. all I could think of was when I was an intern, you know, I was. I came here at 18 and went to NYU. I had multiple internships at, at different magazines, and I never copped an attitude with anybody at any of the internships I ever had. I couldn't, I, I couldn't conceive of rolling my eyes at somebody. And, and, and I would like to think that that was an age thing, or, or rather a generational thing, but I think maybe it was just a class thing, that they were not accustomed, they were accustomed to getting what they wanted very quickly. And, and, and doing grunt work wasn't part of that. So you're talking about people who were Gen Xers in theory? Right. Well, I'm a Gen or, Xer. Right. I'm so talking about younger... I'm, I'm talking about people who three years ago were like 19, 20 years old. Uh -huh. So, so they're these probably millennials who are supposed yeah. to be mm -hmm. so yeah. privileged and entitled. Yeah. Do we Emily? actually believe that people have different personality types based on the year that they were born? I mean, no. or 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 do, are you guys more of the school of <laughs> only based on the month people? and the rising oh, sign? Yeah, right it depends on. where Saturn is. All right. All right. <laughs> But no, is it more just at different stages of life, people are maybe m more apt to be more fo solipsistic and focused on themselves and maybe not thinking as much about like how other people might perceive, you know, their actions. I, like, I agree with you, but I, but I do think, I do think that, you know, if you don't have the luxury of losing your internship because then you can't pay your rent, then you're not going to Oh yeah. yeah, no, nobody's arguing with you about that. But, but the interesting thing about about like um, true, I mean, I'm talking about media because that's all I've worked in. But you know, when I was younger, you became an editorial assistant at a publishing house or a magazine or a, or a newspaper or a junior reporter, and then you worked your way up, and there was a very traditional path. And then that kind of all um, went to hell. 
because of the internet, which is not a bad thing. But there have been times in the past kind of say, a bad thing. Well, the, there are times in the past seven or eight years where I, where I have thought that person didn't really, you know, have to struggle as much as everyone else I know. On the other hand, there are people, there are writers um, who have been discovered from all corners of the country, if not the world, of varying ages, who never would have gotten the attention that they that they deserve because maybe they didn't have great interpersonal skills or they didn't go to Harvard or they didn't, you know, they didn't know the son of so-and-so. Um, and that doesn't seem to matter as much as it did anymore in terms of- You're describing of, people like me. Yeah. Stay, stay yeah, school Yeah, sure, kid. exactly, yeah. exactly. And I think that's a good thing uh, because there were, m you know, a, a lot fewer slots or uh, in terms of entry-level positions or, or ways to be seen, at least in the media. I can't speak for other industries. And there are a lot more now. Um, and you know, there have been times when I would get submissions from writers who I would have guessed were you know, 32, and then I would find out they were like 19. And they were ama like amazing, amazing writers. I'm not sure that they would have, they weren't gonna move to New York um, and, 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 go that, and go that route, but they got discovered. So another thing that the internet has done, that technology has done, is kind of speed up the pace at which we're living our lives, right? It's making it more out there in public, we're always aware of what else is going on with the people that we know in our Facebook community. We get to see everything that they're doing constantly. Um, we're sensing that we need to be tweeting about stuff or blogging about stuff. Well, and we're also stuff. getting feedback on, I mean, one of the things that, you know, the scientists say is important about the 20s is that it's this period of identity exploration and, you know, forming your identity. And you're getting feedback on that identity constantly. Mm -hmm. And that's something, Emily, that you, you know, wrote about in your Times Magazine piece is, is sort of becoming obsessed with that feedback. But the fact that it's even there does seem like something very much of this time probably where where a generational divide might mean something and my question is <laughs> what do you think about that um, you don't have well, to answer that well there's something else I guess the, qu the question is is more like the issue of living your life in public right. which not only media how does it people affect your identity formation right right because this is a time when you are trying on different hats, and yet all the hats become public in one way or another. And I'm not saying that these are only people who are writing for a living. This is what you know. People's Facebook feeds, you know, are are creating an image, no matter what they do for a living. Uh, I, is yeah, I, th I think people who um, are trying to uh, make their living in any kind of a, a public sphere now. And you know, even probably that newspaper in Rochester that you worked at as a very young reporter would still have its its feed open to comments and a, and a Twitter persona mandatory for every reporter now. You know, um, but they have maybe one fourth of the number of reporters, and they're paying mm -hmm. them. They're not compensating them fairly. Yeah, no, it's um, a bad bad scene. Um, well, actually, let me ask. I'm curious how you guys feel about the whole compensation thing. I mean, I worked oh, a that million like hours, and mostly all my life. Yeah. And um, but there was always, you know, enough and a union and a way to work your way up, and you know, be able to make a living wage. Now, some you guys maybe have made a living wage, but an awful lot of people going this route are not. And you, now you're in your thirties. I mean, that's hard. Yeah. No, it sucks. I'm in a ton of debt. <laughs> um, it, you know, there, there are a lot of people who, as Anna said, make their name and get some attention, but you can't actually go to your landlord and say, I got all of these <laughs> Twitter <laughs> followers. <laughs> Will you accept this in lieu of rent? I know I've made that joke before, but like, um, no, it's, it's an economy that hurts people. And um, a lot of people are getting those entry level positions and then staying in them for a really long time because there is nowhere to go. There, when media companies especially want to cut costs, they fire everyone in the middle layer. Um, the, you know, it's very bad. I don't... Um, Sometimes it almost feels to me like the equivalent of playing the lottery. There are a few people like Brian who do very well. You know, they do extraordinary, maybe you guys. But most people don't. Most people don't hit the lottery. You can also appear to be doing well because people can see you. Right. And they can, <laughs> you know, right. but like how, but then, I mean, I, yeah. To your point, Mike, I feel awkward giving students advice, 20-somethings who are about to graduate college, when I say to them, go start blogging, pick a subject, own it, kill it, compete right. with the New York Times. 
knowing that you're right. Some of them are going to win that lottery and some aren't. Right. Also, and they're taking most people's like, most jobs by doing that for free, basically. I think right. it's also interesting that, that what winning the lottery often translates into is getting a book deal, like an old-fashioned book deal <laughs> right. in Putting, our industry. In, yeah, at yeah. least in this industry, but it probably translates into other industries, too. Having had several book deals, I can tell you, it's not retirement. It's not money. the lottery. That's not fuck you money. <laughs> but to, to, I mean, there are going to be so many books about the paralyzing fear that this causes in this generation. I mean, and I, and I witnessed it with my brothers, who are both younger than me, one of whom is in college and one of whom is out, both of whom are living at home. I don't know what that track is for them. And uh, it, it's, it, gosh, I've never been more sad than when I think about that, uh, when I try to figure that out. And of course, I can tell myself, well, I can try to help, but I can only do so much. Well, let's, um, let's talk about that a little bit, because this, there's much that's said about this generation being the first, like, ever that has to come to grips with the fact that it won't be as successful materially as its parents were. Um, how do you think that colors the kind of decisions young people are making now, what it really feels like to be in your 20s and exploring, you know, do you feel like you can't really explore because you have to buckle down? I mean, I'll say I feel it narrows people's imaginations. And, and it, there's, it, you can't really measure the price that that, ex, that extracts. I think I find myself at 27 for the first time worrying about narrowing that. What is that, a field of vision, right? And I haven't felt that until the past year. But I worry about that even more for younger people who don't have access to those job opportunities, who find their field of vision narrowed, whether they graduated college or not. Narrowed um, in what way? Uh, narrowed in the way of uh, these companies are run by 50-year-olds who don't want to give up their jobs. They want to survive a few more years. Thus, I can't get up. I can't. I mean, part of the problem here is, is people who are 30 years older who just want to survive a few more years in whatever industry they're in. Um, we see it all across the media industry. We see it in the intransigence of media companies who aren't willing to innovate or be creative on the internet. But we also see it in other industries. Uh, you know, their, their fathers and their mothers, and then in some cases, their grandmothers and grandfathers, who just trying to hold on in this terrible hurricane that's happening to the economy. I think that affects the, 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 um, the imagination of the 20-somethings who can't imagine getting to those jobs now because they can't rise up. Um, and I don't know what the answer to, or the solution to that is. Um, I, I do think that people are getting screwed on both ends. I mean, I right, think right. young people are getting screwed, but because the way this exists, I mean, the New York Times is getting screwed. Who knows how long the New York Times is going to be around financially? Right. And why is that happening? A piece of why it's happening is because there are so many people willing to do this for nothing or very little on the internet. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's fine when you're 22. I'm actually surprised we haven't seen more protest. Occupy popped up. Occupy was exciting for a lot of people. Occupy died. It, it's still around, I understand that. But we went through... Who do you think has been feeding all and like, helping all no, the people? No, for sure. Just, it's like, still there. It's still there. But, but let, me, let me frame it in this way. We had four presidential debates, and we never heard the word. We never heard the word. Now, if you had said this time last year, you would have thought every debate would have been focused on Occupy, you know, focused on the issues raised by Occupy. I'm amazed we are not still seeing encampments in the United States, in Washington, in, in these cities. I'm amazed there isn't more protest. And, and maybe that's because 20-somethings aren't as angry as I think. Maybe it's because they don't think protests will solve anything. There were a lot of 20-something voters. I mean, <laughs> a remarkable number of voters this month. So maybe they are paying attention in some ways. But I'm surprised there isn't more uprising about these economic states. Well, another question that Sam and I tried to answer in the book is this issue of thinking that people are taking a really long time to grow up these days compared to how long they used to take. And, um, and that's true. I mean, you can look at the statistics and you see that people are marrying later than they used to and having babies later than they used to. And to, to us, it seemed to come right back to technology, kind of, especially uh, reproductive technology. The idea that young women didn't have this age 30 deadline in their heads in quite the same way that, that I did when I was growing up. Um, that, that sort of pushed everything else back. You know, the idea that you could have babies in, far into your 30s and maybe even 40s. Um, but that the, tr tr turned out to be kind of a false dream. There have been tremendous amount of problems, you know, from mm -hmm. higher rates of autism by having babies later, all this fertility stuff that costs a fortune for people to do, heartbreak that goes with that. You know, so that's partly true, but it's partly been an illusion. And I think there's a whole generation of people who felt that illusion, you know, and, and have suffered a lot of pain because of it. 
I wonder if there's another illusion associated with all the online dating sites that exist. All the ideas that another person could be of the next click away, that I can, I can keep trying, I can keep swimming around the pool because the pool's so big now right. on the web. Uh, and that's in some cases an illusion as well. Mm -hmm. Is there anything good? That, ah! <laughs> like, well, hey, I met my girlfriend on Twitter. I love the web. I love the pool. I mean, there you know. we go. The one good thing. <laughs> one good I thing, met right. his girlfriend on Twitter. Anna, were you about to say uh, something? I, I was just. I was going to talk about just having, <laughs> in, in terms of like the kid issue. Um, I'm 39, and I'm, you know, I don't know if I want to have kids. I probably should make that decision if I want to have them biologically, right? But I don't feel that pressured about it because I'm not getting external pressure from anybody. My mother had me when she was 36, which was fairly old for the early mm -hmm. 70s. So having that model, I mean, I, I don't think she ever phrased it. I was, I was considered old. But you know, by the time I was 30, I didn't feel like, well, you know, when my mom was my age, she had done this, this, and this. I, I, so I had, a, I had a role model of someone who had delayed marriage and parenthood well into her 30s and then, and then into her early 40s. So I think that has something to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, just who you see around you. So you're saying that it's a personal thing in your case in particular, but I felt like, I feel like it's a, it's a much more cultural thing now that people just don't have babies. At least um, college educated women don't tend to have babies in their 20s anymore. And in my but day they did. But is that just in New York? I don't know because well, I feel yeah, I don't think it is. It might relate to those economic pressures that they don't feel they can advance. They don't feel like they There's can get to that. where they yeah. want to be at a certain age and thus have to. My Facebook feed would beg to differ. Yeah. <laughs> right? like, really? I think there are, you know, a lot of people I went to high school with had a baby or three. Like they are done having very, babies now. Yeah, very quickly. Even, well, so then, yeah. did you perceive that? I mean, just in terms of like where the pressure can come from. A mother is the most obvious place, um, and then there's you know pop culture. Like what sort of role models are you? seeing there and when do people have babies but then there is the Facebook pressure but, or do you perceive it that way when you see your high school friends like posting their baby pictures are you like shoot this, am I supposed to be doing this too um, I'm a little sad for people for whom um, having getting married in a big splashy expensive way or having a child and then taking thousands and thousands of photos of it and posting <laughs> them for like everyone they've ever met to see is like the crowning achievement of their life frankly I think that's weird and it's public in a way that is unprecedented which like as someone who has made various things public I feel like I should be more open to but I still am skewed out by it haven't really figured out why totally yet possible that I'm jealous um <laughs> well don't you think but, they, but don't you think that parenthood in, in, in some demographics has or having kids has become a kind of it's like a class marker I mean especially well, in New York it's like a baby is the, the most expensive luxury fetish well, yeah, object that you can I mean. own <laughs> I mean that's why that's that's when it becomes distasteful I mean, yeah I, mean, I, I don't think people having kids is distasteful I think that you know trying to being exhibitionistic about it and you know where they went on vacation with the kid or where school the kid got into and they're paying $30,000 a year. I mean like the sort of braggy stuff, but braggy stuff on Facebook is annoying no matter yeah, whether I kids mean, are involved yeah, or yeah, not. Yes. The, uh, everyone the in the internet the is either bragging marker, or complaining. That's not a new insight. One class marker we saw about um, babies is that people in the sort of more professional, more educated classes wanted to, as Brian alluded to, wanted to get a lot of things in place before they were ready to have children. You know, they wanted to feel like adults before they became mothers and fathers. And in working classes, it seemed as though you, be, you became an adult by having a child. Um, you know, that you didn't sort of think that you had to have all your ducks in a row first. You had your baby and then Lo and behold, you had to do all sorts of grown-up things. Um, and that, that was kind of, I think, more the case. I don't know what, what your pattern was, Mike, when you were young. I mean, if you like rushed ahead and had kids pretty quickly, or you had a lot of sex. like I did. No, uh, <laughs> With no, a lot of different dogs. people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's go back to that while your son's in the uh, audience. Certainly, this wasn't a mistake. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I had our first kid, um, I think I was in my mid-30s, um, and it's just what you said, you know, I was, by then I was at the Times, by then I'd sort of established myself some, um, you know, my wife was a editor at a, at a, uh, at a large newspaper. Um, it is a class thing, you know, it, it is, it's a luxury. It's, uh, um, and it does make it easier, because um, having kids uh, is so consuming. 
I mean, once you, the easiest thing is working all the time. You know, <laughs> I'm now at the other end of this, truthfully. I, I, it's so much easier. If you have one thing to do, work. Whereas if you are balancing your relationship with your partner, um, the kids, making a decent, decent living, climbing the, you know, the ladder at work, that's much, much harder than it is for me now. Just, I can work. My kids are launched. So this question of um, work-life balance, which used to mean one thing in my day, I think means something a little bit different for 20-somethings now. Um, maybe, Brian, you can talk about this a little bit, I think, that, and, or Sam, even, that you're, you're kind of like always on and always available to work. And what the balance means is that, okay, you're going to spend a little bit of your evening hours checking your email and, and making sure that everything is, you know, it's not that there's like this, this fine um, distinction between being at work versus coming home at six o'clock and taking care of your family. Um, and I'll argue for the benefits of that. I mean, this is a, obviously a very narrow example talking about media, but um, the freedoms that I'm afforded uh, to be where I want to be when I want to be there in exchange for being reachable are tremendous. I mean, you know, to be literally anywhere in the world as long as they can reach me. I'm, I mean, I'd take that deal any day of my life. But I, I well, I think part, I will. I'm still young. That's not necessarily new. I mean, I've been at the Times for 35 years, or 30 some years, and 28 of those I worked out of my home. You know, mm. it's the same kind of thing. Right. I think what's different today is the expectation. Um, I've written this before. When I used to get a call from an editor on the weekend, they would apologize. <laughs> now when I get a call, if I answer too late, I apologize for not getting back sooner, Saturday night at 8 o'clock. You know? right. So what do you think of that? I think that's terrible, <laughs> right? Does anybody else? Yeah, I think it's terrible. But I've been that editor, you know, yeah. calling people on the weekend and being annoyed when they didn't get back to me. I mean, I understand it, but there's You're terrible. <laughs> I am a terrible person. But, but, but we that hate was, you, Anne. That was an internet like you know, thing. But mm -hmm. what's interesting about what you just asked uh, Brian, it, it, you know, not much really has changed for me between the age I am now, 39, and let's say when I was 25. I mean, I'm married, but I don't have kids. Um, I guess I have a better job. Um, I feel a little more secure, but in terms of my freedom to do things, not much has changed. Um, but I do think that what has changed is that as I got older, I felt more willing to say no. And so I wonder whether 20-somethings have not learned how to put up, put up boundaries and to say no to certain things. Um, like I, I, I'm keenly aware of what the phrase quality of life means as opposed to what I, what I, what I knew 10 years ago. And I'm willing to, you know, create boundaries and say no and push back on things in, in a way that I didn't feel empowered to do. Well, the one younger. thing that's changed is the cell phone, right? I mean, from 25 to 39, the thing that has changed is the tether that we have. Again, I love it. I, it's right there. I, I mean, I, was, I tweeted when I got up here. Couldn't help myself. <laughs> what did you um, say? Uh, my girlfriend accused me of, uh, of panel tweeting, meaning I tweet during panels, which I, I sometimes do. I'm trying not to tonight. So I replied and said guilty. Thank you. <laughs> it is not easy. I would love to read the real-time reaction to this conversation. That's my brain. And I don't know if that's healthy for my brain, but I don't think I can fully control that either. We, the society is so fully engaged that way now. Anna mentioned saying no, and, and I think Maybe, maybe you mostly meant it in a professional sense, but um, no, I, yeah, I did. But but I think, um, and we've been talking about professional life a lot, um, and writing life and journalistic life specifically. But I think um, just as important, maybe more important, is that saying no in your personal life, like realizing who the friends and you know and other, you know, people are in your relatives, lovers are in your life who are like sucking out your life force and just being like, no. I had the experience of I was coming here on the subway and I was sitting next to this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful girl in her obviously late teens or early twenties. And right before this guy, this like, you know, to maybe twenty four year old guy who was wearing like weirdly like um, unfashionable, sort of like Trustafarian <laughs> like outfit um, that came up to her as he was getting off, really like a totally not cowardly move, and was like, said to her, I just, before I got off the train, I just wanted to tell you 
you're, you're beautiful. I just wanted you to know that. You're beautiful. I just wanted to tell you before I got off the train. And then he got off the train. And, like, I, even, like, sitting there next to her, wanted to, like, make this guy feel better about his awkwardness by being, like, <laughs> you know. But she was, like, Whew! like, dead eyes, not giving him anything. And I was, like, wow, that is amazing. You go, girl. I really wish that had been me at your age <laughs> because me at her age was like so insecure about like my worth as a human being that I, I would have been like, hee thanks, even though you're making me totally uncomfortable, but I don't want to make you uncomfortable. So thank you. Thank you for totally publicly humiliating me in this weird way where you think you're giving me a compliment. So um, anyway, being in your 20s is really hard, and that girl's <laughs> nailing it. <laughs> um, what you said about what you said about um, friendship is something that we there was an interesting study that we came across in the book about sort of like what people get out of their friendships at different stages in their life, and that um, when people in their 20s are describing their friends, the words that they use for their friends are often things like, you know, irritating, just really negative <laughs> words. And that people in their 80s have far fewer friends, but they use nice words about them. And I, I mean, it is interesting because you do get something out of those relationships in terms of like, um, you know, figuring out who you are, I guess, and who you want to spend. Also, just not being alone is sometimes useful, you know? I was just going to say when, you, when Emily, Emily was talking that I, actually another big difference between my age or how I am now and let's say 15 years ago is that I have fewer friends because I don't feel like I, I don't feel the need to please everybody all the time. Like I don't say yes to invitations when I don't really want to go and and I don't pretend to like people that are obviously have a have a, a another agenda. But it was very hard for me to say no and to have boundaries in, in in a way that felt empowered when I was in my 20s. And I don't know if that's an age thing or a gender thing or a combination of the two. But well, it does seem to be partly an age thing because you were getting, even though it was exhausting, you were probably getting something out of those relationships. You were helping figure out what you were supposed to do with your life. You were um, setting up um, you know, contacts that you didn't know if they would turn into like the next job or the next mm -hmm. date or any of a number of things. You know? So you, um, that is the tendency in your 20s is to just sort of not say no to anything. Uh, and maturity maybe is figuring out that you can't do it all. Well, so th I mean, I guess the question is, do you wish you had said no more in your twenties? A little bit, yeah. a, a little bit. I mean, I don't regret it. But one of but one of the best um, moments of my twenties was when uh, I did a book. I pitched a book. It got sold, not for a lot of money. It was not the lottery. <laughs> it was, um, and I had nine months to do it in and do it in, and it was pretty research intensive. So I quit my job at a magazine. I hated the job anyway. And I had to do this book in nine months, and I could have done a good book, or I could have done a much better book if I if I worked at like 200% capacity as opposed to 100% capacity. So I basically spent the nine months working feverishly, and for the first time in my life was able to say no to people and have an excuse. No, I cannot go out to dinner with you because I have to finish the book. No, I cannot hang out with you, mom. I can't talk to you now for an hour. I mean. Like, I, I had this great excuse to say no to everybody and to be, to be you know, to, to spend time with myself for the first time I think since I had been a child. It was akin to like playing, playing with myself like on the floor with like Fisher Price toys, but instead I was doing a book. Um, and that was one of my, that's one of my best memories of being a 20 something is the nine months that I got to say no to how people. Old, how old were you then? 28, 27, 28. Mm -hmm. And so then what happened? when you came out on the other side. I had a very hard time um, dealing with people because I really, I really liked my own company. <laughs> I realized, which, which I didn't feel guilty about, but I, didn't, I felt it was very hard for me to socialize or, or, or start socializing with Soon people again. Soon after, Anna became a professional blogger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we can open it up for some questions now. Is Debbie here yeah, with yeah. the microphone? OK. Yeah. Remember your ages. Okay. Got to mention Rem your ages. You have to mention your ages. And also, when, when we come to you, like actually ask a question instead of making a statement. I thought you were uh, going to sugarcoat that. I thought that was our plan. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, we had a whole plan about what was how the to plan? make that sound positive. How, how do we do it's that? Very so it's very, very oh, right. excited to hear from you, and we want to hear from as many people as possible. Right. And so in order to keep things moving, just make sure that you make it a question. At the very least, <laughs> raise your voice at the end. See, we can tell you're younger because yeah. you still want to please people, make them nice and right. happy. Right. It's a waste of time. Don't even bother. Wait for the mic, too, please. Um, I, 
been listening with a great deal of interest, and I'm, uh, two questions that occurred to me. One is, you guys uh, you are all in the media, as I am. I'm also in the media. And do you have a perception of people your age who are not in the media and who are not in New York City as being, having the same or different problems, issues that you have? And the second question, which I'll get in even though, do you want me to answer that and then I'll do the second? No, good. Ask, ask your second as well. Uh, the second is, I've uh, forgotten your name next to Robin. Brian. 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 Brian, you said something about how you resented the fact that there were uh, people, men and women in their 50s, who were hanging on to jobs, meaning that they, yes, me too. That, well, you were uh, 60, Michael. <laughs> right. well, hanging even tighter. <laughs> I'm 60 something too. Um, that you thought, why aren't they going to move so I can move up the ladder? But the fact is, we're not going to move up. I mean, why should we move out of our jobs? Yeah, sure. And I think perhaps one of the issues that you might have, and this is a question, do you think any of this is due to the fact of longevity? We're simply living longer. Right. Uh, can I pull the Obama thing and say second question first and talk about that? I, I completely agree with you, and I think a lot of it is longevity, and it gets back to the idea of science. What's going to happen when these people all live to be in their hundreds? I hope I do. Uh, I, I do. I, you know, when, when I talk, when I say that, I know it sounds callous to say that there's this this uh, layer that's hurting the, the layer be below them. What I, I see it specifically in the television industry, which I write about, I write about TV, and I find that a lot of the reasons why innovation is stifled, why there's a protectionist culture at the media companies, the reason why I can't stream the networks on my iPhone yet, I can't watch TV legally on my phone very easily yet, is because they're just trying to hold on business-wise for a couple years, for a few years, because we're in uncertain economic times. And I, I guess I see that, and then I look at what happens to that uh, to the layers of people in the management chart? Um, so I, I don't uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think they're doing the right thing. They're doing the logical thing. But I think it may hurt the, the layers below. Um, you know, sometimes at journalism schools, I tell students that there's been a forest fire in the industry, and that they should be secretly thankful that half the journalism jobs in this country have disappeared in the last 10 years, because they're going to be the green shoots that come out of the soil. They're going to be the, the new trees that start to grow out of the forest fire landscape. And I think that's true. But uh, the forest fire, thankfully, hasn't hit everywhere. Um, you know, and, and that's a tension that I feel across the media uh, landscape, I guess. I don't think it's just stubborn, stu like, you know, like old, old people are stubborn. Like, my parents both work. My dad is 65, my mother is 72, and they work because they have to. Right. Like, they, they don't the have any, thing. they right. don't have, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not the same world it was when you could retire, you know, be, be middle class and have a nice cushy retirement savings. So I mean, a lot of people lost work. their savings in that 2008. So I, yeah. Right. Yeah. But then there's still a question of well, maybe I mean, there's more that companies can be doing to make the most of those people. You know, it, I don't think that there's right. anything wrong with right. a 65 year old wanting to be working. But but is there um, if if people have been in the same job for 25 years, uh, then they tend to get sort of complacent, and so maybe there is as well, longevity. Fre it frequently, becomes... the best combinations are both of them. I mean, right. I, I benefit. I, when I got to the Times, I was 21, barely 21, and I walked around saying, I have a lot to learn, I have a lot to learn, and I didn't know if that was true. But I, I realized now it was. You know, I feel like I had to say it just to not piss off people. But the question I, and is, now I look how back you... and I realize I had a lot to learn. I couldn't do my job without the people that have been there for 20, 30 years. But, but the best combinations are the, the, the 20 somethings and the older generations. And I don't know if companies do a good job of harnessing that, right? right. Taking of, advantage of, of that. Yeah, like creating sort of mentor relationships, right. but then also right. making sure that a 61 year old gets moved into a position where he's walking around saying, I have a lot to learn too, because that's an exciting feeling and that makes you do better work. Mm -hmm. right. And w with longevity, in theory, people will be entering into second and third careers also as they get older, if they get tired of the career they're in or if they feel as though they're becoming um, you know, sort of eased out. But that doesn't seem to be happening as much as I might have expected. You know, I mean, people are still working into their 60s and 70s, but they seem to still be in the same jobs they started at. Robin, it's hard to switch. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there are very few opportunities mm -hmm. for a 55-year-old person to switch into a new job. Right, and that's another, that's something that could be changed. There could be a culture that says here is this, 
you know, uh, this manpower that has a lot of experience in A and we're going to retrain them and help them get into B, but it doesn't seem to be happening that way. If you look at the unemployment numbers for baby boomers, the unemployment rate is lower, so they're better off, but once they lose their job, it takes them a lot longer to find a job than the you know, younger people, so, which is just what you're saying. Looks like there's a lot of other questions. Hi, uh, I'm 28 years old, uh, and I guess I'm also one of those lucky lottery winners that Mike was talking about who went from writing for free to uh, getting a paid gig. Uh, so in that case, I do wonder, you know, what is everybody's advice for people who don't seem to have any other, uh, any, any other, any other options but write for free and maybe have an audience uh, and get some clips uh, as opposed to just giving up? I, I was curious if that's the only other option. I guess I shouldn't say push out the old people. Mm -hmm. I, that's no, not the right You already that. did say that, <laughs> I think. Not the, I did not say that? Do not? God, I'm terrified to look at the tweets now. <laughs> um, well, I, writing for free is an interesting piece of advice for a young journalist. Um, I, I get the feeling that young people in all sorts of fields are using the web to sort of create all sorts of jobs for themselves. You know, go sell some product that um, nobody else has thought of. Go invent an app. I mean, there's, there seem to be a lot of young people who think that they're, they are going to win the lottery, and so they're doing all sorts of webby stuff that I can't even understand. I'm 29. Uh, my question is actually the one that was asked earlier uh, that hadn't been answered yet, but um, the perception uh, that people have of people who are not in the media or not even in New York. Because I think when we talk about this generation, the way it comes across is this generation of New Yorkers. I'm from a really small town in Virginia, and they, the people that I went to high school with are all using Twitter and all using Facebook in the exact same way that me and my friends in New York are doing. Um, they're probably just as unhappy and dissatisfied with their lives, but they have been forced to become grown-ups, what we classically referred to as a grown-up as working a job yeah. and taking care of their children. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, people younger than me that I went to high school with are paying child support because they've already been divorced. Um, so I wonder if that was, because uh, I haven't read the book and I don't, I don't know if that is something that you kind of covered, that generation really kind of doesn't qualify what we're talking about so much as maybe just classes and maybe geographically. Well, geographic is a big thing. I hear that all the time of people who, who come from their small towns and find out via Facebook or some or a reunion that um, their, their peers are way ahead of them in terms of um, you know, going through the markers of adulthood. Um, unfortunately, we tend to hear about what's happening to a generation because it affects people in the media's drenched New York and then we kind of read all the headlines that call this generation all sorts of things that aren't, don't really apply out into the hinterlands. And it, it does seem to be, um, I mean, clearly one of the class things that, um, that we write about some is that there's this, this subset of young people called fast starters who by the age of like 24 are um, at pretty good jobs and own a house and have a child and, and what's unclear is what happens to those fast starters in like 10 or 15 years. They're that fast because they didn't go to college and so they went straight ahead and, and started to do all the adult things that um, they think they were supposed to but not having a college degree ends up really hurting you. I think there's a really um, interesting insight there about the notion that I mean, I do, I do think one thing that's hurting uh, young people in general is the increased stratification uh, of, of income, uh, income inequality. However, at least we can all see each other on Facebook. I mean, that's the strange, creepy, incredible thing about the 20-somethings, the, the ones that got Facebook in college or in some cases high school and have had it ever since uh, they, you know, um, they had a cell phone, essentially. The fact that we can see, if we live in New York, what our friends from our hometowns are doing, and conversely, 
we can see what our the hometown friends can see what their friends across the country are doing is really new and interesting and i haven't actually read a lot about that but i'm curious about what it's going to do at those 10-year college reunions and high school reunions because uh, those are starting to come Nobody up will go. for we this generation yeah. well, well right will we go will will we what do we find out about each other um yeah at least for all of the negative things we've set up here and there's a lot of things to say that are negative at least we can all in much more clear ways see what each other are up to and how we're feeling and reacting and you know that's maybe the best positive there is about this generation. It's we may all not want to see it, but we can see it. It's interesting because I used to think that, um, I kind of still do, that I'm glad that I wasn't a teenager in my 20s when Facebook was around because then I would have perhaps documented mistakes that I made. But right. maybe there's something to be said for, for being able to, for putting your mistakes out in public and, have, and, and learning from them that way. I mean, you know, the, a lot of them are secrets I keep that no one knows. They, they don't exist on a social network. Um, in the same way that, you know, Young adults nowadays have videotape of them, of what they were like when they were three-year-olds, or you know, or two-year-olds. And I have no concept of what I, what I was like as a kid, except mm. what you read on a on a report card, bossy, you know, or <laughs> talks too much. But I have no I have no visual evidence of that. So I kind of am jealous of twenty-somethings and maybe you know, early thirty-somethings because right. they have a documentation of 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 their lives. That well, I think it'll end up to, oh. going to what Brian said. Um, it doesn't, I, I'm just thinking out loud, I don't know what to make of this, but it doesn't seem to promote cohesion. You would think it well, would. Well, I'm thinking it does in some cases. I think it may yeah. strengthen friend networks. I was on Monday night, found, uh, Monday a, a friend from college was uh, really hurt in a car accident. By the end of the day, there was a hashtag for him on Twitter. Right. And that, you know, I, I guess we would have all called each other's landlines and gotten the voicemails mm -hmm. when we got home. But we all knew by 10 a.m., right. right? And that sort of thing is probably going to have a positive impact on this, on this community, so to speak. But does it spill over, again, I'm just thinking out loud, into the economy, into the political world? And socially, there's no question. Socially, right. I just, you know, it's a huge difference. Yeah. Um, but does it spill over into some, in some other way that's... Uh, not that I've seen, no. Yeah. But socially, it might not be that cohesive either, because if you are able to see that your friends who stayed in your hometown are living one kind of life, and you off in the big city are living a different kind of life, you might not actually feel closer to them, you might feel more distant from them. No, you take screenshots of their status updates and mockingly send them to the friends that you do feel close to. And they, right? Am I the you only guys one do that? You do that, actually. <laughs> you totally do that. I've Am seen I? you. <laughs> Am I the only one that thinks the internet in general as a society makes us nicer and friendlier and more connected? Yes, you're the only one. Really? <laughs> I mean, my goodness. I... Uh, all right. Let's take more questions. We have, we have time for one more question. Right. Last question. <laughs> Samantha, pick last question. How about right up here? <laughs> I am Tori. I'm 22. Um, I hate 22-year-olds. <laughs> no, I do, because I know they know things that I, as a 27-year-old, am never going to understand, that I'm already behind. Well, I guess <laughs> I'm just wondering why you think there's such a fascination with being a 20-something, because we have a whole panel on it, and I know I've seen several like New York Times articles that me and my friends have made fun of. One was ooh, centered. Ooh. Wait, wait, wait. Ooh. One was centered at UNC, which is where I graduated from, and it's about how there's this like crazy gender ratio and all the girls are fighting over all the guys because we're never gonna get married. And then um, there was another more recent one just about um, you know drinking and like pre-gaming and like, Instagramming. I'm, the Syracuse story? Yes, it was the more recent one, yeah. Um, you can tell we, I've noticed them. <laughs> <laughs> well, me and my friends all sent them around to each other and like kind of laughed about them because yeah. it's a, definitely a microscope on our age group. Um, and I'm just wondering whether or not that's because we're more out there on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever, or if people are just generally fascinated with us. As the youngest person, <laughs> I'll try it first. I mean, to, to my, the, the joke I made was not entirely a joke. I, the, there's, an, there's a sense, because of technology, that as you age, you're not going to know. I, I, for instance, I have no idea now how to code. When I was 21, I knew how to code. I've lost it entirely. I know that I could never even learn it now because it's so much more complicated, but the kids at 21 get it, right? I think part of the fascination with the generation is they, are, they have such proficiency, they, we, whatever, have such proficiency with technology and thus have all these keys to the future 
that older generations don't. And but I, the, I mean, the technology thing is specific to right now, but the keys to the future thing, that's kind of timeless, right? That older people sure. are always going to but be now, kind of they, intrigued by... Because of the by... increasing speed of technology and because of the phones, I mean, the, it's such a revolution that's happening in our pockets, right? Who is the most admired person of uh, this generation? Mark Zuckerberg, probably. Um, who we all want to be Mark Zuckerberg, uh, right? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, well, I like when I was, a, I mean, who uh, else can we look up to? When I was in my to? like teens and late twenties, I wanted to be Kathleen Hanna. Like that was my role model, and the idea that I would ever meet or talk to Kathleen Hanna was like outlandish and crazy. Mm. But like, I can tweet. But at now her. I can write on his bike. <laughs> and, and, and now I can people, write on Zuckerberg's people wall. People growing up yeah. with that expectation of proximity and being able to communicate with people who you really admire is like um, creating a sort of awesome like fearlessness and a sense of like social per permeability the sense that like wherever whoever you are and like whatever you're doing right now might all, like all change in an instant because like someone has faved your thing <laughs> you know I think, and it might be an illusion but i th feel like there's still power there's like still sort of energy around that illusion and i sound like a hippie again <laughs> well i, I think, think you guys are sorry go ahead I, um just the, it sort of started with the baby boomers. Um, the generation before, kids were told to you know, be quiet and listen. Suddenly the baby boomers came along in the 60s and 70s and they seemed to know things, supposedly, we didn't, but we seemed to know things um, that the parents didn't. And I think ever since then, we've had a society where young people are considered to have the, uh, the, the knowledge, the center, uh, who are looked up to and who maybe are feared a little bit because they know more, they, they have more insight. But th this question of why the media is suddenly so interested in people in their 20s, I think is, is not the right premise. I mean, I think that, as Mike suggests, the media has always been really interested in people in their 20s, at least for the past 30 or 40 years. The, the t Time Man of the Year on the cover of Time Magazine in 1967 was Youth Under 25. So mm -hmm. that was a long time ago that they were just like The last really time there was a serious protest movement in the country, right? Well, I'm, that's I one way of looking I'm, at it, I'm yes. I'm young and I'm not <laughs> history, but I mean, point being, the economic conditions, the social conditions right. caused a serious protest mm -hmm. among but, young people. But just like wanting to know what the youth are thinking is right. just, you know, just an evergreen. Yeah, but the the, also her generation is more visible because of technology. Like we, we can all see what they're thinking and feeling in a way that we couldn't. Um, and the, uh, the exciting thing about your generation is that it's much more uh, diverse. And I feel that yeah, they can move between demographics, if that's the right word, more easily. I mean, because maybe they're literally mm -hmm. multiracial or because of their understanding of the world. I, I, I just feel like that, that, that part of my fascination with 20-somethings is, is, is that they, are, they feel global because they can exist in many different kind of little um, friend groups, demographic groups. Um, I'm not making sense, I don't think. No, but. you are. I think, <laughs> this I think is what I'm saying too. Right. It's like it's some, to some extent it's illusion, the sense of like accessibility and permeability that, they, that technology provides. Right. But there's a little tiny corner of it, of that truth. dream that's true. And yeah. what the work of, of your generation is, I think, is to make it true. <laughs> like make the, the, the promise of the connection real in, you know, IRL meets that's like, <laughs> that's a killer ending, Emily. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's there a great go. ending. Thank you. Thank wow. you for the panels. Fantastic. And thank you all for coming. <laughs> <Thanks> for <it. laughs>